Apple has gone from revolutionizing the smartphone market to stalling its advancement. This shift has smothered an entire industry. That is the U.S. Justice Department speaking about the antitrust lawsuit launched against Apple. They say the tech giant has monopoly power in the smartphone market, which boxes out competitors. The lawsuit takes aim at the so-called walled garden Apple has built around their iPhone and other popular products. Apple responded to the claim, saying that it threatens the principles that set their products apart in competitive markets. The tech giant says they will vigorously defend themselves against the allegations. All right, it's time now for The Intersection. And given all the tech news happening today, meeting at The Intersection, a group of tech experts to help break things down. We've got Carmi Levy. He's a technology analyst joining us from London, Ontario. Mark Hayes is a privacy and technology lawyer and arbitrator in Toronto. And Nicole Verkent is a tech entrepreneur and angel investor. Thank you all so much for making time for us this evening. Um, Carmi, I want to start with you and talking about this Apple ecosystem because Apple hasn't ever really been known as being particularly open about its technology or being able to manipulate it or personalize it from a user's perspective. Why do you think the scrutiny is on Apple now? Well, I think when you're the biggest player in the playground, you're going to get the attention. And, you know, they call them walled gardens for a reason. The company that builds them gets to make the rules, gets to determine how the various actors who participate in those environments behave, gets to set limits on what they can and cannot do, and gets to impose financial structures on everyone who participates. Obviously, that playing field tilted to the advantage of the company that builds it. That's how Apple became the behemoth that it is. Uh, that's how companies like this ultimately grow. Uh, they own the landscape and they tell everyone how they're going to behave. The problem becomes, at what point uh, does it become kind of creating this crucible for innovation? At what point do you go over that line toward drawing a line and preventing others from growing their businesses within that context, within that landscape as well? And that's the that's the $64,000 question at the center of this massive lawsuit is that, you know, did Apple go too far? Did it build the landscape and then unfor and then start punishing those who chose to participate in it, thus harming not only their businesses, but the sectors within which they operate. Nicole, I want to bring you in on this idea of, of the walled garden, because, you know, as a tech entrepreneur, also as an investor in tech companies, how important is it for a company to have a separation between itself and its competitors of, of some extent? Well, it's absolutely everything. And, you know, they say walled garden as if it's a forbidden place. You know, buying an Apple product is a luxury product. It's a choice. I have chosen that product over Android. Um, and, and as an angel investor, I would never touch, invest in, get involved in, run, operate a company that didn't have a very clear, we call it moat, the exact same thing, something that protects some kind of IP protection. And so it is, I believe it's a slippery slope to say that you cannot have a walled garden because to me that's saying you cannot build an ecosystem and there's so many companies and platforms that are built with that mentality in mind building a two-sided marketplace somewhere where there's a, there's a culture and that you're you know feeding off other products that you've bought that's building more value um, for the first product that you've bought. So I do think we have to be very careful here. And we can't say that there is no competition for Apple. In the first three months of 2024, they lost 24% of their market share in China because of competitors. So I think this is a little bit extreme. And I think it's it's a slippery slope for tech companies. Yeah, that was an interesting one. I mean, China did get involved there in terms of, uh, you know, pushing away from, from Apple products and that tended to uh, make people turn more to the, the Huawei products or alternatives too. Um, Mark, can you give us some historical context here? I mean, a a Apple's not the only one that has faced this kind of scrutiny. Microsoft, another giant in the space, has, has faced something similar in the past too. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what the uh, Department of Justice actually started their claim by outlining the uh, rather interesting history here. Apple was almost bankrupt in, in 2001, and they, uh, because of an antitrust suit against Microsoft, 
were able to get iTunes onto Microsoft computers, and that allowed them to be able to have success with the iPod, which was their, their first really successful uh, mobile uh, uh, device. Which led to which led to the success of the iPhone later. So they benefited from the opening up of the Microsoft market, which also had a walled garden, based on software rather than hardware for the most part. But once that was opened up, that gave Apple the chance to be able to grow it the way that they have. So basically, what the Justice Department is saying is that just as you had to let people into the Microsoft milieu to get around their walled garden, uh, that Apple was able to do and then grow, the same thing happens in this case, and that's what they're attacking. What they're attacking is the, the policies and procedures that are used, the rules that are used by Apple to keep other innovators out, or at least to maintain control uh, in Apple, in, as opposed to allowing innovators and other companies to be able to move the market forward. They're saying they're limiting the amount of the market. And interesting, this, interestingly, this isn't just speculation. The Department of Justice has been investigated for a long time. Right. And when you look at the claim, there's lots of emails, internal emails I've already got, where Apple is saying, we are trying to control the market. We are trying to prevent competition. So it's going to be interesting to see how they get over those internal communications. Mark, what do you make of Apple's arguments that it has created this ecosystem in this way to protect users' data and, and their privacy? Well, that, that's been the argument that Apple has made all along, is that uh, they have to control what the apps are, they have to control how the data flows, uh, and have to control external software and external devices from being able to get into the walled garden, or at least only being able to get in on their terms, in order to protect user privacy and, and security. And there is a good argument for that. Clearly, uh, I think you've seen Apple is one of the more secure uh, mobile networks. You don't see as much hacking on Apple as you do uh, perhaps in other milieu. And, and that is partly because of these things that they're doing. But you can only hide behind that for so long, because if you are trying to protect uh, privacy, if you're trying to protect security, but you then use that to stifle competition, uh, they may be able to show that they've gone too far. And Apple has not been known uh, to be one of the best in the business in terms of protecting the privacy of their users. They share information in a lot of contexts, uh, both in the software and the hardware side. And so to some extent, it's a defense uh, as opposed to a, a real concern about security and privacy. I feel like we could talk about Apple all day, but there is one more topic that we want to touch on, and that is Reddit. It made its way to the stock market today. It went public. Um, this is a long time coming because it had initially intended to go public a couple of years ago, but it took some time to get there. Here it is today. Um, Nicole, I wonder what you make of this, uh, because when you think about Reddit and what it is, uh, how it's built, it's built on, you know, users using this this platform and contributing to this platform. What kind of pressure does going public and having investors wanting profit from this company, what kind of pressure does that put on Reddit? Well, I think it's put a huge amount of pressure. Everyone in the tech sector is looking at it. I know a lot of companies that were wanting to go public in the last couple of years, but but didn't because of the macroeconomic environment. Um, we saw Instacart's IPO. It had a big first day, and then it ultimately wasn't very good. And what I think people don't really see under the surface is that really affects funding rounds long before an IPO. And so it even, even affects the early pre-seed stage companies if the IP, IPOs in the tech sector are not doing that well. So I think there's a lot of pressure generally on the tech sector. In terms of profitability, it's kind of ironic. I mean, this platform has been around for 20 years. I've kind of liked it, not loved it, never been addicted to it, but their user base is extremely loyal, but they also are very finicky about, about not wanting Reddit to necessarily make a lot of money and the way that they've traditionally made money is through ads. Um, so what I think has caused this success today anyways, has been the AI story tied to the data. And, um, and so I think what it has proven is that any IPO in the tech sector that's got AI attached to it yeah. is uh, is going to be much more successful. Yeah, the AI component is interesting here. And Mark, I want to get your take on this because when you uh, when you hear what Reddit is doing, it's licensing some of this uh, some of its content, so that user generated content in order to help sort of inform AI models including uh, a deal with um, Alphabet's Google so far. What 
should users think about that in terms of their content being used in this way? Yeah, I mean, there, there's two two quick points about this. Um, there was an announcement by Reddit about a month ago uh, saying that they had entered into a contract with a large AI company. They didn't name the company, but funnily enough, five days later, Google came out and put out an announcement saying, oh, we're the big company. Uh, right. And the, to, to say there had, that probably had some impact on the IPO is probably an understatement. Um, the second thing is, in order to look at what they can do with the with the data, uh, is it's really important to understand that you have to look at the terms and conditions of the site. And the Reddit site gives uh, Reddit the right to be able to use your content, anything you file, anything you post, to use it in uh, and provide it to their partners, to people they have contracts with. In this case, of, of course, we're talking about Google and others. So, so there's the, this massive AI uh, collection of data that's going on by all the AI companies. And interestingly enough, uh, now, of course, the FTC is just in, in the United States has just announced that they're going to do an investigation, a non-public investigation of Reddit and whether they actually had the right to be able to uh, send all this information to Google and other AI producers. Hmm. And in Canada, just yesterday, uh, the Competition Bureau said they're going to do an investigation into uh, into the, the use of uh, information in, uh, in AI platforms, uh, including Reddit. So there's a lot of moving parts going on in the AI world, and it impacts the financial world as well. And I absolutely agree. That's, that's why there's a 50% pop in Reddit today is because people see it as at least partly an AI play. Yeah, it, it is interesting when you talk about the fine print, though. Uh, when you're using some of these sites, uh, a good reminder to read it, but there's so much of it. Uh, Carmi, I want to get your take on this because I was checking out Reddit and the reaction today because with, the, with seeing the stock jump in such a way, um, I did see some people talking about how they were already selling uh, because they wanted to make that initial pro profit. We know that some Reddit users got to get in on the IPO from the, the, the ground level. Um, but we also know that Reddit is the uh, birthplace of the meme stock. So how much potential is there? here for Reddit to, to fall into that category itself, do you think? Well, it's interesting because that so-called friends and family discount that they made available, I think, to, for, to about 8% of, of uh, shareholders uh, who sort of qualified for it, uh, doesn't have a lockup requirement. So they can sell at any time. So they can, you know, cash in on day one's pop and then walk away with a nice profit. Uh, of course, it's it's unusual. Uh, and I know financial analysts were sort of questioning the why. Uh, but I don't put a whole lot of credence into day one results. It's let's look at the first, uh, first quarterly earnings. Let's look at their ongoing results and see if... That one deal that they have with Google translates into a parade of deals if it's a sustainable model because they've essentially staked the entire IPO on the potential of these AI training deals uh, to fuel their growth going forward. That the value of Reddit really does lie in almost 20 years of of data, of user-generated content that's been saved and stored in 100,000 plus subreddits. So that ultimately is the story. I think it's high time that we have this conversation that the AI industry stops applying just sort of a broad, you know, giant vacuum cleaner to the internet approach to train their large language models and starts defining where they're pulling it from. And so the FTC will investigate, certainly in Canada, they'll look into it as they should. But the fact that we're having these sort of more focused uh, efforts to identify higher quality data and use that to train artificial intelligence models really does bode better for the future of the artificial intelligence intelligence industry that they can't just simply grab data under the cover of night, that there has to be a specific arrangement for it. And the fact that they're leading with this as part of this IPO, I think is a good sign the rest of the industry really ought to follow that model. Yeah, really important uh, uh, aspects of both of these big stories today. We have to leave it there, you guys. But uh, thank you so much for your time. Great to get your perspectives on this. That was Carmi Levy, technology analyst, joining us from London. Ontario. Mark Hayes is a privacy and technology lawyer and arbitrator in Toronto. And Nicole Verkent is a tech entrepreneur and angel investor. Thank you guys so much.